Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's Zoom Info webcast, Turn Up in a Downturn, how, to, how marketing teams can succeed during an economic change. We are so excited that you're joining us today. We're going to kick things off shortly, but I just wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. If you have any technical issues, please use the Q&A box. We'll also have time for questions, so please be sure to submit your questions in the Q&A box. Um, I also wanted to just share, I'm just going to scroll forward, our safe harbor statement. So I'm not going to read the whole thing. <laughs> As you can see, there's a lot of info, but Zoom Info is a publicly traded company, so this presentation may contain forward-looking statements. Any buying decision you make should be made based only upon currently available products and offerings. And again, our safe harbor statement is here for your review. So before we get started with today's webinar, we have a quick poll that we would love to just throw out to everybody. We just wanna get like a feel for who's in the audience and make sure that we are touching on the points for everyone. So I'm gonna push this out. And um, the question is, if you could just briefly check off what team or department you fall under. So is it demand gen, is it customer marketing, marketing ops, sales, sales operations, or revenue ops? And while everybody's answering that, um, we are really excited to welcome our speakers today. So we have Ashley Elleveld, who is a senior demand gen manager here at Zoom Info. We're also uh, joined by Cameron Kilgore, the VP of Revenue Operations, and Dom Katabe, Director of Demand Gen, both from Acton. So I want to thank you guys for joining us today. So excited to have you here. Uh, Ashley, do you want to just give a brief intro? Sure. Thanks, Dory. Happy to be here with you guys. Um, I am actually in charge of all of uh, Zoom Info's international marketing. So that is demand gen. It's everything behind you know website experience and things like that i really coordinate with all of our other experts in-house to make it happen for international markets and have been in the SaaS world for a while now so it's always an interesting ride in this industry and i really enjoy what i do and the tools i use and geeking out on everything marketing I'll pass it over to Dom. Hey, everyone. Um, my name is Dom Canabe, uh, Director of Demand Gen here at Acton. Um, yeah, I think the, the title says a lot of it. I, I am focused on all things Demand Gen, um, so both inbound and outbound activities to, to bring awareness to our product and offering. Um, I've been in marketing for probably about, I think, about seven years. I actually started as an SDR, so um, I have had the benefit of being on both sides of the coin there, and I'm looking forward to sharing some of the strategies that I've learned over my, my time as demand gen person. Cool. Uh, thanks, Tom. Um, I'm Cameron Kilgore. Um, I've been in software and technology for about 25 years now. Um, my background is uh, in corporate finance, mainly in FP&A. Um, it, I also have experience in sales operations and then leading data and analytics teams. Uh, today, I'm VP of Revenue Operations here at Acton. And um, throughout, throughout this conversation that we're going to have today, I'm going to take the point of view of, of what you may encounter from a corporate finance perspective, an FP&A perspective, as you know, as you go into budgeting and planning for the next uh, fiscal year. Great, thank you. Thanks for taking the time to join us today and share your expertise. Um, okay, so we are going to push out our poll uh, results and we've got a good mix in the room, folks. So um, looks like we have about 20% demand gen. We have a good even split here between customer marketing and marketing ops, so 33.3% followed by sales, sales ops, and revenue ops. So um, looks like, uh, again, a good representation, and we're hoping that uh, we're going to be able to kind of touch on different points that are important to you all in your roles, and then again, answer any questions towards the end of the webinar. So, all right. Um, so today, for today's webinar, again, it's really talking about doing more with less and really how to make the most of your current MarTech staff, especially during you know, today's current economic conditions and climate. So um, I know the team here has spent a lot of time working on, uh, you know, our pertinent questions uh, for this event. So we're excited to have this discussion today. Um, Ashley, I will 
start with you, I guess, um, and ask this question. What are some of the common MarTech challenges that you've seen arise as organizations are building their stacks and, and then add optimize to over time? Yeah. The biggest one I encounter no matter where I go and who I'm talking to are data silos. Data silos are just the worst and it's always a challenge when you're integrating multiple platforms, each with different KPIs and targets and things like that. And so, you know, sometimes we marketers can live in spreadsheet hell because we don't have a unified platform for those data silos, but yet we need all the insights we need to drive revenue in the best way we can. So really um, data silos can cause problems with data hygiene. Um, the more you scale, the more you know inbound sources you have, the more data you have to clean. And um, it really comes down to a strong operations team to keep things crisp and um, clean and functioning well. And it's super exciting to see so many marketing operations people on this webinar. So hello, everyone out there. Great. Thanks, Ashley. Dom, um, you know, as director of demand gen, do you have anything you want to add there in terms of that question? Yeah, I think Ashley's point to data hygiene is, is huge. Um, every, every organization I've been to, no matter how sophisticated they are, they have issues with data hygiene. I think it's just one of those natural um, things that's always going to exist just because with with the tech space developing as much as it has, there's, there's just way so many tools. Um, but uh, again, doubling down on the consistent, making sure there's consistency around how you're reporting on specific things and how data is flowing from one tool to another is super important, um, both in terms of uh, making sure all the relevant touch points are being mapped, but also that the naming conventions and how it's set up is as identical as possible from system to system so that there's no confusion as, um, like we looking at Tableau versus looking at a tool like Qflow or any other tools out there that you're using to look at your data that you have the consistency across so you don't cause uh, confusion or, or conversations that don't need to happen. Um, the other piece, uh, a challenge that I've seen is people purchasing tools that have really powerful solutions, but not really having the internal resources to deploy them properly. Um, I think that's, it, it's easy to get caught in um, tool A or tool B has, has all these different functions that are really cool and, and something that could help drive demand or drive interest. But if you don't have the, the t internal team to even develop those tools or develop those functions well, um, it's, it's adding more complicated data and complicated solutions in your tech stack that you're not getting value out of. So it's, it can be more expensive to do so. And it also causes, again, additional opportunities for data to not flow properly from one system to another. Uh, and I think the last thing for me is definitely around making changes and optimizing without giving things enough time to come to fruition. I think uh, it, in, in a in an economic standpoint like we're in now, it's 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 um, easy to get caught in the weeds and say, hey, we we made this change, it's not working after only two weeks, and and moving on to the next thing. But a lot of a lot of programs and channels require more time to really to vet out before you decide it's not working. So uh, making sure you're giving giving yourself an apt amount of time to really understand the data that you're getting back from these changes before going and trying something new. Great. Um, Cameron, from your perspective, you know, just MarTech challenges from like a revenue perspective, would love to hear your thoughts there. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you my perspective from kind of two different lenses. First on the data and analytics side, um, one of the big challenges, just to echo um, the previous comments, is, you know, lack of master data management and data governance. And these are pretty foundational things to have determined across the organization cross-functionally and make sure your, your organization has the discipline uh, to have to stand up a data data governance committee and then you know you have tools in place for master data management so that, that it flows across all the systems so that that's my viewpoint from a data and analytics from a from a planning and budgeting and sort of fpna perspective i think the real challenge is you know for the marketers to be able to come in and easily and clearly prove the ROI of the MarTech stack. Because what's happened over the last several years is there's become a lot of adjacent technologies that find their way into the stack. And, you know, oftentimes when we go into budgeting meetings and we ask about a technology and we talk about the spend, 
and ask the question about the ROI and the total cost of ownership of a tool, you know, you can get a kind of deer in the headlights kind of, you know, look um, when these questions are asked. And, and secondarily, I think Dom pointed this out, is like tools will get brought in, there'll be a business case for that. And then we find that there's maybe not the in-house um, uh, expertise to finish the implementation of the job. And so then we get a surprise budget request for contractors and so forth to come in and finish the job. So those are some of the elements that uh, some of the challenges that we see. Great. Well, and, you know, talking about MarTech stack and bloat and just the sheer number of solutions that are out there, it's mind boggling. <laughs> I think I had an infogram somewhere that had, you know, just the number of MarTech solutions and it, it really can be a challenge. And, you know, we are in the golden age of MarTech and the number of solutions is constantly increasing. I guess um, we'll start with you, Ashley, but what advice do you have for today's marketers on just how they can deal with the bloated uh, MarTech stack? Yeah, I think it's really important to carefully consider exactly what your use case is and how many of those elite features you really need from different platforms and providers versus providers that can um, offer a comprehensive platform that takes less manpower to manage, less integrations, less potential gaps in data hygiene and things like that, and um, really unify your teams as well. So, you know, here it's it's great to be using the same intelligence platform that our sellers use, for example, because it means we're looking at the same accounts, the same signals and the same activity and that really brings alignment to our go-to-market motion and it cuts down on the number of platforms we need to unify those two teams so i think really considering platforms that can do more for you um, versus specialization is super critical great advice great advice dom what about you what are your thoughts there yeah, I think um, to Ashley's point, tech consolidation can be super valuable for cost savings. And I think especially in the current economy, like it's something to be cognizant of. Um, the other the other thing I like to add there is just looking for um, looking for that overlap when you are buying consolidated tools, because I think uh, it, it's easy to um, to buy more than you need. And I, I brought the point up earlier, um, and, but being very conscientious of of what you actually need from the platforms and making a decision that way, I think uh, really what, what needs to be done and what you need to be thinking about is rather than buying buying everything that you think is going to add value, focus on a few things that are going to be really important for your go-to-market motions and doing those really well. So whether it's um, I, I like the mention of like intelligence solutions, like you should have a, a, a tool that's everybody in the organization is using versus having every department have their own little function. So something like that. But with marketing automation, for example, um, like we are, we're specialized in marketing automation, but we we do the the important things, and we're not wasting time or effort on developing stuff that you don't necessarily need to do it well. So um, yeah, I think if if nothing else, uh, just figure out what what your niche is, what you actually need, and focus on those, and don't don't try and boil the ocean. Good advice, Cameron. What about you from just a revenue perspective and dealing with the Martech stack load? Yeah, I mean, my perspective on it is never stop learning. So there are just an incredible um, array of applications and, and products that are available for very, you know, niche kind of things around the core MarTech um, stack. But I'd say continuous learning. Um, so taking time out of your week to be researching what's out there. Um, and, and then it really comes down to your strategy, right? So a lot of companies, you know, go for a best of breed approach which is fine as long as you don't have a lot of um, overlap between the technologies, you know, creating, you know, waste if you're not using various features and enhancements and things like that. And then other, another strategy is to go a platform-based strategy, right? So, you know, a company like Zoom Info, basically you, you get a best of breed within a platform um, given the strategy that they've deployed in terms of, you know, making a lot of acquisitions and rolling those in. Um, so if there's a consolidation play with your MarTech stack, I think Zoom Info from a platform perspective makes a lot of sense. From you know, our perspective at ActOn, you know, we're a company that's been 
solely focused on marketing automation for a long time and we've maintained our investment in product where whereas a lot of the competition some of the bigger guys have you know we're we're acquired with the thesis to keep crm sticky and you know it's debatable whether they've maintained the investment um in marketing automation so you know our company continues to invest in terms of the best of breed play um and you'll find that you know we hear this from a lot of our customers that were you know oftentimes half the price of a marketo or a pardot an eloqua and we do everything that they can do um with just a you know lower total cost of ownership but you know in order to in order to understand that you have to do the research go out there and look for companies that are solely focused on that application or that part of the martech stack that you're evaluating so just you know continuous improvement continuous learning and um you know let's try to stay away from doing multi-year deals and getting locked in you know it behooves you to have optionality um, with one-year deals and so forth. So you, if you do want to make change, you can. Um, those are some of the, the bigger ones that I have. Great. So I guess as, as folks start to focus on and, and more importantly, you know, prove the value that their MarTech stack delivers, especially in the current conditions, economic conditions that we face now, I guess, Dom, that question really goes to you. How can folks really, you know, focus on that and, and prove that hey, you know, there's value here um, and working with what they have. Totally. Uh, I think Cameron hit the nail on the head before, which is just establishing ROI on all your programs and channels. Um, I think the the traditional marketing model is to look at leads and MQLs. And over the last several years, like there's been a conscientious shift to, to be more focused on the bottom line metrics of pipeline and revenue. And you are doing yourself a disservice if that's not what you're focused on when you're looking at your channels, because ultimately, Marketing and sales are two sides of the same coin. So if marketing's hitting their goals of leads and MQLs, but sales isn't able to convert those down funnel to the pipeline and revenue targets they have, then marketing is not winning. Like both teams are losing together. So if if uh, if you're focusing your your um, your like your your metrics on that, it, it helps um, as as like the top line metrics that you care about most frequently. And I think the other piece is um, taking into consideration the time cost of each product. Uh, again, like. When, when there's a huge, there's so many MarTech options out there um, and not every tool is easy to deploy and nor is it easy to maintain. So making sure that even if, even if something is high ROI, and this is why I think like the, the idea of focusing on single year agreements versus multi-year, so you're able to, to make shifts um, is you got to look at the opportunity cost of if, if one of the people on my team is spending 15 hours a week, 20 hours a week managing this tool, when they could be doing these other activities, like is that actually the RO, a high enough ROI to to make that valuable, or do we need to consider like what could also be done in that time if we had a more simplified solution that may have equal results or barely negligible, uh, negligibly lower results, um, but they do get that time back to focus on other activities. Great. So, Cameron, I guess with that question from your perspective, and just you know the ROI on folks MarTech stack, um, how, I guess, how can folks again, just prove the value there? Do you, what's your take from a revenue perspective? Yeah, I mean, I'm fortunate to work with a person like Dom because he gets it, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think the, the biggest the biggest thing is to, to be ready. Um, if you're not already experiencing a, a tough planning year right now, you know, you will be. Um, this is this as we go into FY23, you know, th there's a lot of indicators that it's going to be tough sledding at, at some point in the year. Um, you know, we're seeing some things out there. You know, there's a lot of big tech layoffs announced over the last several weeks. I expect there'll be more. Um, and when you go through these cycles, you know, there, there's normal business cycles that always occur. And right now we're, we seem to be heading into a cycle that, um, you know, it's going to be slow growth to, to no growth out there in, in the economy. You have to be ready. You have to be ready for people like me who are going to come and challenge every line item in the budget. So it's not the same. The world changes. And, you know, in, in many years, the software amortization, uh, ex the expense amortization of your software subscriptions, they go through the budgeting process fine, right? Because it's been built into the expectation and run rate for years. And if you add technology and tools, they, they amortize over the length of the agreement. So it's not really scrutinized as much. 
Um, this year is not like that. So there'll be people like me that show up and knock on your, your door and say, hey, let's talk about the tech stack. I want to know the ROI on every single tool that I see here amortizing over the year. And so you may get into a situation where if you get a 5, 10, 15% bogey to go decrease your tech spending, um, you're going to have to come back with an ROI. And so my, my advice on this is be ready, be prepared, know that it's coming, take the time to go do this hard work, which it's hard the first time, right? You can, there's tons of ROI calculators out there that you can just pull off the web and, you know, find a template that you like, that you understand and, you know, use the 80, 20 rule, go through 80% of your applications and take them through the ROI calculator. And when you do get questioned, you know, you're going to be prepared to answer intelligently on the type of ROI that, that you're getting from your um, applications. I think where I've seen things go sideways quickly is when you get into those budgeting conversations and you ask these types of questions and the teams are not really prepared to answer them or they didn't utilize their finance partners to you know, assess things, that's where it, it, can, go, it can go badly and you know, you'll get an arbitrary cut or something. That's what you want to avoid. Um, so I would find a template that you like, that's easy to use, um, and kind of just do the rinse and repeat on the 80, 20 rule for your, your tech stack. Great. Thanks, Tom. And, uh, thanks Cameron for that. I, Ashley, I guess we'll go to you, um, and just yeah. really get your take on this, especially with limited resources and dollars, you know, what are your thoughts there on proving the value of yeah. tech stack? I think it's it's especially scary when you have lim limited resources and dollars. And to uh, Cameron's point, we know a lot of change is coming up in front of us. You know, we we've all experienced a lot of change over the last two years and the last quarter, especially things in the economy have been weird. So, gearing up for another year of that as a marketer being asked to do more with less and expect change. I think it's really important to um, echo Dom, Dom's point of time to market and time cost and choose platforms that can immediately impact your speed to revenue generation. Um, when you have limited time and limited resources, your need to prove yourself immediately is there and so, Investing in technology that you can deploy quickly and efficiently without all the added resources or 12 to 18 months timelines for um, return and investment is absolutely crucial. Um, and I think also showing leadership how technology can help you scale, can help you automate certain things, can help you uncover new opportunities that before would take a lot more resources to uncover and um, really showing how you can better use your times, your team's resources because of the scalability that this tech is offering is especially crucial in these kinds of times. Great, thanks Ashley. So I guess with MarTech Stack, when we talk about like reporting out you know, onto channels. Um, maybe we'll start with you, Dom, on this one, but what are some of the key marketing performance metri metrics that marketers should really kind of pay close attention to um, to see how their channel is performing? Yeah, I think it depends where you're at in the funnel. Um, cost per MQL is always something that's gonna be important, especially when you're comparing two vendors within the same same channel or same program type of program. Um, the, it, it shouldn't be the only thing you're looking at. Like the lowest CPM QL is not always going to be the best. I think the an example of that, if you have 10 MQLs that come in for $100 per MQL and it only converts at 10%, but you have another program that's generating MQLs at $500 a piece and they're converting at 50%, like they both cost about $1,000 to turn into an opportunity, but the more expensive one only requires effort on two MQLs versus 10 for the previous. So like, even though they look the same, they, they don't operate the same. So I think that's why it's also important to make sure, and I mentioned before, is focusing on the bottom of funnel performance to see what's actually turning a pipeline and revenue. I think leads and MQLs are great for optimizing and understanding the directional performance of, of your programs, 
but um, it, it, you need to be looking towards the bottom, especially as we are making these more difficult decisions um, with, with uh, how, how the market's looking. Great. Ashley, anything you want to add there? Yeah, I think Dom's Dom's point of measurements of, of bottom of funnel and, and top of funnel cost per MQL, those are absolutely essential. But in order to understand like that comparison between programs, for example, you really have to stay on top of your channel KPIs and, and not let performance slip because um, it might be at the start of the year, you have a great for example, webinar program, perhaps, but and you continue to invest in it like usual, but you don't keep a close eye on what's working for registrations and topics that are really engaging people. And so staying on top of metrics by channel is definitely important. And we all know those can vary greatly from channel to channel. Um, it's one of our challenges when we're looking at overall performance are those data silos that can happen by channel. Um, so really just identifying what's important for you by channel and staying on top of that. It's definitely crucial. Great. So in terms of tools, um, like when, you know, you're tracking the performance of marketing campaigns and looking at the results, I guess, Ashley, what do you suggest um, for tools? What are some of the tools, you know, that you would kind of run with? Yeah, I would say tools that definitely can integrate within each other. Um, having a tech stack with integrations that play nicely mm -hmm. is essential for you know putting some stopping stop gaps in for those data hygiene problems or for that unified data silo look so really um, in my day-to-day -day, having a CRM and a marketing automation platform and um, a CDP that all integrate into Tableau is my world <laughs> it's taken me out of the spreadsheet hell and put me into Tableau and Tableau is amazing because you can unify so many different data points and then add filters and things like that and where it gets really great is when you have teams that are all using the same data source so for example finance and marketing looking at the same numbers in tableau sales and marketing looking at the same performance metrics in tableau that is um for me, super crucial in monitoring performance, reporting on campaigns, and having access to the results that we need at our fingertips. Love it. Not having to look in 10 different places either. <laughs> or ask, or ask, you know, finance for their, their spreadsheet of this, yeah. and then ask this team for that. You know, it's just so much easier to have it all unified. Yeah. yeah. Dom, what about you? What what um anything? Um, you want to follow up on with what Ashley said or any advice there on tools? Yeah, I mean, she hit the nail on the head with with having one source of truth. I think like Tableau is great for that to get a full funnel view of things. I think it's also important to um, not necessarily a, a tool, but um, making sure that your UTM parameters that you're using are set up the same everywhere, especially with your marketing programs, so that as it flows through, like you're able to accurately compare things. Um, and then I think the, the last piece is uh, I, I personally love Excel and Sheets. <laughs> I think like uh, t obviously tools like Tableau make it so you don't have to use them as much, but when it does come to getting into the nitty gritty and manipulating data on a more granular level, like using tools like Excel make that much easier. And the other bonus is when you have, when you're measuring on fields that are changing, um, you might have like a target account checkbox on an account, um, being able to store that in a place that takes a snapshot. So when that does change, you always have the, the historical data is, is important as well. Great. Cameron, what about you? Yeah, um, a couple of things. I, I mean, Tableau is great, probably the best for data visualization, in my opinion. There's a lot of different um, data viz applications out there, but I think there's a step in the middle um, that, you know, I could make a recommendation on. Depending on your company, you know, you may have um, a BI team um, that's, a, you know, corporate resource that you can tap into and, and get them to do things inside a data lake or write your, write your SQL and all sorts of things like that. But often that's not the case. And there's kind of this middle area. And I think 
people need to be aware, and this is again why I said that you know you, you got to keep looking out there for solutions because there's technologies that I've come across, technology like Alteryx, which is basically a data, data engineering application that can bring in data from different data silos and do the data engineering all in a GUI-based workflow. So you don't need to rely on somebody to write the SQL. It's writing the SQL in the background. And then you can take that data, okay, and take it to a data visualization tool, whether it be Power BI or Tableau or, or any of the others that are out there. And that's really become democratized at this point. I mean, these are desktop applications that you know are, are pretty low cost. And, and now you don't have to go to the well to get somebody to go, you know, write ETL and, and write your SQL to conform things. You can do it, you know, with some training and a, and a desktop application to, to get there and, um, you know, get to that point where you have more of a unified data model. Great. Um, what about folk, what about steps uh, that marketers can take to help with unifying data across channels and really looking at, you know, pinpointing, um, inefficiencies. Uh, Ashley, I will start with you on that one. Yeah, I think um, Dom and Cameron have both touched on this earlier, but I'll, I'll echo it. Just really considering what's in your tech stack, first of all, and evaluating whether you need everything that's there and um, cutting the fat where you can to make a more efficient stack. And also just working really closely with your channel owners and your operations teams to really outline what your programs are, what your uh, fields and, you know, all the, the random things you're going to need that are going to feed data into your systems to ensure that everything is standardized, clean, and there aren't any gaps for, you know, inbound data into your systems that could really just mess things up. Good advice. Dom, what about you? <laughs> what advice do you have um, for unifying data and pinpointing inefficiencies? Yeah, I think the points Ashley made are, are spot on. And and the thing that I would recommend to do that is definitely to document everything. I think um, uh, Cameron mentioned earlier having an MDM team. Like not everybody has the the bandwidth or the capacity to even build one of those, but a great starting place is to make sure that field usage is well documented, what's plugging into what is well documented. That way, as you you do have people who are able to take a look or you need to dig into issues that occur, you have a very a, a first place to look at, at any moment um, to make sure that, that there's some consistency there. Um, and then the other piece is definitely around understanding the frequency that data is going to be updated across systems. Um, your, your CRM generally is going to always have real-time data, but the tools that it plugs into isn't necessarily always the case. Uh, for instance, our, our Tableau instance updates every like four hours, I think. Um, so at 8 p.m., it's going to look a little bit different than it is at 12 p.m. There's going to be a big jump, or 12 a.m. Um, so just making sure that that's, that's documented as well and people understand that outside of the real-time system of that would be a CRM or an MAP, um, the, the tools that are plugged in aren't always going to be perfectly up to date. So um, that communication is important as well. Yeah, one, one point I would echo here too is just from a hygiene perspective, and it can come out of different departments, but you, you know, you often see the, the view of the world from the application layer. So you'll, you'll, you'll see um, an application layer um, diagram that says, okay, this application talks to this application and whatever, and, and that's fine. And also, you know, you need to document the data flow. So for me, what's what's even more powerful is if I can see, you know, a data layer diagram telling me, okay, this is where all of this is how all of this data moves throughout the systems and the type of data. You know, these are the business nouns that are flowing through all of the different systems. That's a different view of, of the same construct. It's it's I think what happens is, is it's much easier to do one at the application layer. Um, than the data layer, which is a bit more complex, but it's, you know, I think, I think both are required as living documents that you can point to. Great advice. Um, I guess, you know, as we think about like the current economic climate and, and Dom, I'll pass this question over to you. What are some quick wins for um, folks to accelerate their pipeline in the coming year? 
yeah, I think number one with, with economic downturn, like the number of at bats you're going to have is naturally going to decrease a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to 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 handle that well, is you shouldn't end marketing engagement at pipeline creation. I think more often than not, you when an opportunity is created, it's with a single individual. But every purchasing decision has a, an entire committee that's involved in in making a decision. So building out programs if you don't already have them to help get those committee members engaged on uh, early on when they're in the like discovery phase you're going to have uh it's going to improve your the length of your sales cycles as well as improve win rates as you get those people more involved early um i think the, the other piece is drive targeting with purchasing indicators um i mean we have zoom info in here who's probably one of the best at, at doing that with with their intent data um, but there's a, there's a ton of different tools you can use out there, not just looking at intent to really understand what people are looking at, whether it's um, engagement with specific types of events or um, attendance at a webinar, for instance, but engaging with people who you know have have purchase indicators and focusing more on those um, before, again, spraying and praying is kind of a waste. It, it's, it's, it'll waste your resources if you're relying too much on that. Um, another piece is reviewing your lead scoring. Uh, I, I think at the start of COVID, there was a huge shift in businesses that were growing and businesses that were not. I think um, when you think of like virtual comms, like companies like Zoom, they skyrocketed and companies in like supply chain and hospitality, they had a hard, hard, hard time. And I think with an economic downturn, there's always going to be some people who are facing a, a downturn and they're going to be people, people, ah, people who are seeing growth. Um, so if you can, uh, pivoting a bit to prioritize the ones that are still growing. Um, and then the final point, and then I'll, I'll hand it off to Ashley, is definitely disqualify early. Um, do it, and it, it hurts to to say that because you don't want you often more often than not you want to try and get people through the door. But if if you have conversations early and it doesn't seem like they're actually that interested, don't don't spend so much time there when you when you don't need to. I think like getting people out of your uh, funnel early on versus having them progress and then realizing, oh wait, this wasn't that great of a fit or the purchase intent really isn't there. Um, it wastes wastes more resources than you would think. So, um, yeah. Great. Ashley, thoughts on accelerating pipeline? <laughs> yeah, I, I feel all of those things so much, Dom. Um, it's definitely things we are currently and actively doing. And just to echo your points on getting hyper-focused on targeting. And to me, that means everything that you just mentioned, you know, it's using intent to find those signals and those people that are hot and capturing them when, when they're hot. It's taking a look at your scoring model and making sure that you're going after the right ICP and the right fit when you really need to tighten the belt and double down on things. Um, and really just spending your budget where you're going to have the highest impact and the greatest ROI. And sometimes that means you have to cut things that you enjoy or you know produce results, but not the same result you know you need now. So, um, and then I would say my final piece that is super helpful uh, for me individually in, in many of my roles is my partnership with sales and just making sure we are partners and we are in lockstep and we are driving towards the same common goals, whether that's an MQL to demo conversion rate and working hard to, to lift that rate or it's bottom of funnel win rates and improving those conversions. Um, whenever I am super tight with sales and aligned with them on goals, I find that pipeline acceleration just kind of naturally happens. So can't emphasize enough the partnership between sales and marketing. Great stuff. Thanks, Ashley. Um, marketing and sales alignment, so important. Um, all right, super. So we do have, I'm just looking at the time, um, just in the interest, it looks like we have a few minutes for questions. So audience, if you have any questions for our guests today, you can submit those in the Q&A chat box. So um, that's going to be located on the right hand side of your console. So feel free to go ahead and submit questions. Just going to give everybody a few seconds to, it looks like we have some questions trickling in right now. Um, Perfect. So, Ashley, maybe we'll start. This this question is from uh, Mike, and uh, we'll start with you, Ashley, on this one. It says um, he's asking, "How do I convince my executive team not to shrink our marketing budget next year?" <laughs> so, a lot of people are asking that. <laughs> yeah, um, I think that 
comes back to showing your value, showing how uh, you can do speed to revenue generation and how you can scale the business with the right resources um, and really prove your impact. And also um, one of my secret weapons is being tightly aligned with a sales executive that can really be the champion for your business because um, if you have a sales executive rooting for you alongside to the marketing executive, that just helps makes your case better. A happy, happy sales team and successful sales team is definitely a success metric for us marketers. So having that executive advocate on your behalf can be very impactful. Great. Dom, what about you? Do you want to, you want to take that question as well? Yeah. I mean, I, it's definitely second Ashley's point, partnering with sales to have a champion on their team definitely helps with the conversations. Uh, I think the, the other thing I'd add, and we, we covered it a bit in our, in our session too, is um, boiling down your ROI to each, in each channel to show that the budget you're working with is actually working is super powerful. And using that to also share the case of, okay, if you shrink this budget, here's what the impact looks like in a number of in, in dollars. Um, and yeah, having, having that measure handy <laughs> when the conversation arises is definitely helpful. Yeah, and I, I sort of spoke to that earlier as well. So, you know, having the due diligence completed ahead of, you know, the budgeting cycle um, is super important. Fin finance will get comfortable knowing that you went into your budgeting and planning with a strategy. So you could come in with a strategy and said, look, so we came in with a strategy to not grow expense by more than 2%. And here's how we did it. Um, to the extent that that thinking has been done ahead of time and you know not been mandated um, from above, um, that's that's one way to get through it. The other thing is, you know, if you're proposing new technology or anything that may be accretive, did you look for the trade-off um, options out there, whether it be in you know uh, contra contractors that you may have, could you you know decrease that spend? Um, if you had to, could you you know, repurpose um, an open headcount um, into into that expense. Um, any new tech, it's like, did you push on payment terms? You know, did you try for net 90 payment terms or quarterly? Did you um, go for a one-year agreement rather than a three-year? Um, all of these things are likely going to be scrutinized heavily, if not already, and. You know, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a replan at some point in next year's planning cycle where you get through a quarter or two and you realize, oh, gee, the PL doesn't work anymore. Um, you know, you need to be pre prepared for that. So anything you can do ahead of time um, is helpful. Um, the thing about it, though, is, look, we're all in this together. And so, you know, if you're if you have your, you know, sort of your you know, just team hat on and, and thinking about the business as a whole, you know, you'll make the right decisions and you know where there's waste and, and where there could be, you know, money that could be repurposed. But I think all of that due diligence ahead of time is super important. Great. Thanks, Cameron. Um, again, audience, if you have a question, please submit it in the Q&A chat box located in the right-hand corner of your screen. I'm just going through now. It looks like we have another question that came in from uh, Melissa. And this question is basically, how do I identify what's working and what's not working with my marketing programs? Um, Ashley, you want to take that one first? Yeah. <laughs> KPIs, baby. <laughs> Always look at those KPIs, but not just once a month or once a quarter. I am in there week over week looking at trends. I'm looking at trends year over year, month to date. I We are tracking pacing on everything. So really just looking at your channel KPIs, your funnel KPIs, and doing it at regular intervals, ugh, intervals really helps you catch when there are outliers or when there's something trending one way or another, good or bad. It, it really, the more familiar you are with your data and how it performs week over week, month over month, and with seasonality, I think the better it is 
it, the easier it becomes for you to identify trends and then course correct quickly. Great, Dom, what about you? Yeah, I mean, aside from metrics, talk to your sales team. Um, I think you, you'll always be able to get the objective feedback from the numbers uh, and what you have in your analytics and tracking solutions, but feedback you get from your sales team can be just as valuable, especially if it's if it comes, you get the detail and the, the um, frontline feedback on what's working and what's not. Um, and I think I encourage that to be a regular conversation you have with your sales team to get specific examples of, oh, these the leads that came from this program performed really well, like we got good engagement, because it doesn't always show up in the numbers. Um, and it also gives you some feedback on messaging because they'll they're they're talking to prospects that you're you're targeting with your ads. So if if they're hearing a lot of the same things, like your messaging should be adjusted as such, um, one way or the other, whether it's doing well or not doing well, it's like they're they're always going to be a resource uh, from the front lines to help you there. Yeah, and Dom, just to echo that, um, from my experience too, covering international, I have very unique conversations with the sellers in each region on one campaign, for example. Like one campaign can perform one way in EMEA and completely different in A and Z. And I only learn about those nuances when I have conversations with our sellers that are on the ground responding to the leads that come inbound from those. And so I, I just want to echo the importance of that to, to really learn your regional nuances as well. Great. Thanks, Ashley. Um, I think we have time for one more question. So this one has come in from David. It's Cameron, it's more a question for you. So I'll throw this out to you. Um, how do I make my case finance? Uh, what do people in finance need to know in order to feel confident in uh, my proposal? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've mentioned it a couple of times, but when you're thinking, you know, first of all, go out and do the research and find a, a total cost of ownership model. You know, Gartner and, and others produce these things. Um, there's, and, and you want to find one that's simplistic and easy. Now, we're not looking to, we're not, personally, I'm not looking to go challenge every assumption in a gigantic model that's telling me the total cost of ownership in ROI. I tr I'm giving you trust as a fiduciary of your company that you're doing that, right? But I do want to see the basic math. I want to see that you've got the people costs associated with an application, that you've got the basics on the subscription costs, and sort of the, the other ancillary things that are in there. So just by being a marketer who has taken on that lens, you're already in a, you've already, already on your front foot forward. Most often than not, this is not done. So if you do this type of work ahead of time, um, and even if you're not a finance person, reach out to your finance person and say, hey, look, I've got this total cost of ownership model that I think is gonna work for us. What are your recommendations? Is this, is this gonna be helpful for you? Um, and be vulnerable. If you're not a finance person, ask the dumb questions because you know there, there's we're all skilled at different things in our, in, our, in our jobs, right? And I'm sure they'd be happy to help. Um, so those are the ki kinds of things that you could do. Um, and, and you know, don't overthink it, state the business case. And, and you may learn something too. Hey, you may look at one of your applications and go, oh, wow, this doesn't have an ROI that I thought it did. And then you can be proactive and kill that, you know, application or that program in favor of something else. But that's how finance gets comfortable, that, that you're thinking about as a fiduciary of your company, that you're doing the right things and you're making, you know, informed decisions based on data. Great. Um, it looks like we actually I have a question here that um, was kind of highlighted. So maybe we'll do this last one. This, this came in from, YL, sorry, I'm botching your name. <laughs> um, and it, the question is, I work for a small startup. We don't have a, a very big marketing budget and we have two people working on marketing in silos. We're working towards building um, systems, but not there yet. What should be the initial goals for a first year marketing team with you know limited resources and budget? So I will throw that out there. Dom, maybe you wanna <laughs> take that one? There's a lot there to unpack, but. Yeah, it is a it's a bit of a loaded question, but I think the 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 first thing you want to do is really determine what what your goal with these marketing programs is. I think that's the the with with a startup like you might not necessarily need to create um, 
huge amounts of, you, you might be focused on awareness. You might be focused on building out pipeline, um, but really level setting with yourself on what's the most important outcome of your marketing programs is important. Um, and then from there, establishing what your, what, what your, um, your like financial goals are. So uh, if you have a pipeline target or revenue target, building that out and kind of building the model out backwards of, okay, if we do this, my sales team can manage this many leads, this number of MQLs, um, they can manage this number of opportunities, kind of trying to get to the, the bottom of your metrics all the way through the funnel to kind of establish, okay, this is what I need to get, or this is the number of things I need to put in the top to get to that bottom level goal. Um, and that's where you start. And I know those are both super loaded um, pro or processes. Like there's, they, they take a long time to do. Um, but from there on, then that's when you start to build out your, like your need from a tech stack perspective and making sure that it's all plugged in um, to everything. So um, uh, Cameron talked about this a lot of doing your research on, on the different products. And I think um, we've all three shared the same sentiment of like, focus on doing a few things first before you start to get to in the weeds with with other programs, other solutions. So start with, um, I definitely think like data is the core of any strategy. So get a data solution in place. Um, look at marketing and marketing automation tool to make sure data is flowing through your CRM, through your programs and everything is, is connected. Um, and then you might start looking at specific channels uh, that it, hopefully you have some, some metrics already in place from specific channels to see which ones have brought in uh, inbound traffic, or it sounds like there's some silos going on, but get to that ROI for those, the, the programs that your two marketers are already working on to start making decisions on what channels are, are going to be the most valuable for you. Um, because yeah, with only two people working, you don't have that much time. Um, so building out your, your, your goals and tools to get to understand and map out those goals is the priority before you start digging into actually building out the programs that you're working on. One other piece of advice. That's totally you. right. Yeah. One other piece of advice I'd give you is, um, and it's the least sexy part of doing this, but get your business nouns determined. So what is customer? What is product? What is region? All these things are foundational. And in the future, when you're wildly successful and you're out of startup days, you don't have to go back and fix it all because it's much more difficult to go back and get alignment on master data management and data governance when your company's already, you know, in a mature state. So while it's less fun, you know, getting alignment on all those topics and getting a master data management tool in place is um, pretty important. Ashley, did you want to add something? <laughs> yeah, no, I just was going to say uh, Dom's totally right in, in setting the foundations up in terms of just aligning on goals and hopefully you've tested some programs and seen you know what's working and what's not but if you haven't really starting with just a select few because you have limited resources and limited in terms of headcount and budget i'm assuming so um, trying to do a few things well and then really looking at your cost per win how much is it costing you marketing dollars to bring in every win and where can you really get the most out of your investments? Great. All right, well, uh, I think that's all the time we have for today. So I just wanna really thank um, Ashley, Dom, Cameron, thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to join us and share your um, experience, expertise with our audience. I also want to thank our audience. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to, um, to join us. and. As a reminder, we are going to be sending out the replay of this webinar. So you should get an email probably within 48 hours. Um, so there'll be a replay of this event. Feel free to share that with your colleagues that um, you know may benefit. And then lastly, please note, we have some resources that can actually help you. So um, you'll wanna check out our free marketing and um, lead generation tool. There's a link that we've included there down below. Um, and also a resource that um, Acton shared. So you should be able to find that information in the webinar console. And then last but not least, um, we do have our Marketing OS demo. Um, we have uh, folks that would be happy to provide you with the demo to show you how that works. So again, thanks everybody for joining. We hope you have a great rest of the week and um, we'll see you soon. Take care, bye.